On September 26, 2021, I and three other Fire Emblem players, Original Raisins, Castle 345, and Kirby Fan 66, were scheduled to take part in a normal mode draft race of Fire Emblem 6 The Binding Blade. I expected this to be a competitive race, and committed a lot of preparation time in the month leading up to it. Unfortunately, as the race date neared, two of the competitors withdrew, citing inadequate readiness. As no one volunteered to substitute, the race was postponed indefinitely, and it will probably never happen owing to the reluctance of experienced draft racers to race this game. So as strong players such as Mecha and Raisins couldn't be convinced to draft race FE6, where could I expect to find three other people who are willing and able to make for a competitive race? Well, it turns out that this was a pretty simple task. Let me introduce you to my three doppelgangers, Bomb 151, Pom 151, and Kong 151. And together, we will share with you all that there is to know about draft racing Fire Emblem 6 The Binding Blade. If you follow Mecha or me, you may have spectated a Fire Emblem draft race or two. The concept is simple. A group of usually four players select characters that only they may use, and they try to finish the game in the shortest amount of time using only those characters. Thus, the event is divided into two phases, the draft and the race itself. In the draft phase, the four players are randomized to a selection order. They then add characters to their team following the format of a snake draft. In this format, each player drafts one character in the order to which the players were randomized. Once each player has taken their turn and picked their character, that is considered one round of the draft. The selection order is then reversed in each subsequent round. So if you number the players 1 through 4, the selection order would be 1, 2, 3, 4, then 4, 3, 2, 1, then 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. This pattern resembles a snake, hence the snake draft. There are other ways to conduct the drafting process, which I won't get into, but this is the simplest and most common method that we use. Once all draftable characters have been picked, or once all players agree to terminate the draft early, the draft phase ends. Note that not all characters in a given Fire Emblem game may be draftable. Usually, there are a few units who are designated as free, meaning that all players may use them. Free units vary between Fire Emblem games and even between rule sets of the same game, but generally they fall into a few categories. They can be units who are essential to completing the game, such as lords or avatars, units who are centralizing for a large portion of the game, such as Jagans, and units who provide a unique utility that would be too strong and limited to a single player, such as dancers and a handful of other oddball units. Keep in mind that there is no such thing as a standard draft race rule set. The rule set for each game is curated by its players to promote fair and interesting competition. For example, even though all three of these characters fit the Dragon archetype, Soth from Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn is free to use for the entire game, Marcus from Fire Emblem The Blazing Blade is free to use for just the first six maps before he's banned, and Titania from Fire Emblem Path of Radiance can be picked by a single player. Rarely a rule set totally bans a unit due to their over-centralizing power. Such examples include Chris from Fire Emblem, New Mystery of the Emblem, or the Three House Leaders from Fire Emblem Three Houses. Once drafting has concluded, we can move on to the race phase. In the race phase, the players try to complete the game in the shortest amount of time using their drafting teams. Essentially, this is an asymmetric any percent speedrun race. This seems pretty self-explanatory, but actually it's a bit more complicated than at first glance. The premise of a draft race is that players must use their drafting team, and only their drafting team, to get the lowest completion time. What happens when a player uses a character whom they didn't draft? This is where penalties come into play. For most rule sets, there are three kinds of actions that can incur a penalty. Deploying an undrafted unit from the preparations menu, unless specifically allowed to, using an undrafted unit while they are active on the map, and using any banned in-game functions. Some examples of this are enemy phase skip in the modern Fire Emblem entries, or certain glitches like the Control Enemy glitch in the GBA Fire Emblem entries. Penalties manifest as extra time added on to the end of a run. For example, using an undrafted unit may incur a 5 minute penalty. The severity of this penalty is arbitrary, but it should be serious enough to deter a player from using any of the undrafted characters. So this seems simple enough. Don't use the units that you didn't draft, and you'll never have to worry about taking a penalty. But hold up, I don't mean to wax philosophical, but what does it really mean to use a unit? For example, we can generally agree that an undrafted character shouldn't be able to attack an enemy in combat. This is clearly an example of using that unit, but what if the map is set up in such a way that they can't avoid combat? Should they be able to take an enemy attack without hitting back? In a similar vein, are they allowed to be put to sleep, silenced, or berserked? And if they become berserked, do they incur a penalty from attacking an enemy while they are not under the player's control? It turns out that the answer to this question of what it means to use a unit isn't straightforward at all, and there exist whole paragraphs and rule sets that define what is and isn't a permitted use. I won't bother explaining every edge case here, 
But if you'd like to view the full rule set for this Fire Emblem 6 The Binding Blade draft race, it's linked in the video description. Before we move on to the draft itself, there's a couple of other provisions to the Fire Emblem 6 rule set that deserve a mention. First, all GBA Fire Emblem races often use a script that advances the random number generator or RNG on every frame instead of only when certain actions that call the RNG are performed. This modification to the base game prevents RNG manipulation, which can guarantee incredibly unlikely results and defeat the point of a draft race. Second, note that the end condition of this race is to reach the epilogue and not necessarily the good ending, which means that we don't have to play any of the paralogue chapters or the maps after chapter 22. Unlike in Fire Emblem 7, Fire Emblem 6 does not allow the player to decline a paralogue if they meet the conditions to access it. Because it is optimal to skip all paralogues, this race uses a modified version of the game that automatically skips them. This stops players from forgetting to intentionally fail a paralogue requirement and having to play an extra chapter, which is a small mistake with a large impact on the outcome of the race. So now that we understand the context of the race, it's time to move on to the draft itself. I randomized my three doppelgangers and me into this drafting order. Pompon is first, Konkon is second, Bonbon is third, and I am fourth. The Fire Emblem 6 rule set for this race designates six characters as free to use for the whole game. Roy, Marcus, Merlinus, Lorem, Elfin, and Fa. We'll set aside those six units and then proceed to the first round of drafting. Pompon 151 has a heavy decision of the first overall pick. The first two rounds of a draft are by far the most important, and a poor selection costs a player the race before it even starts. In the first round, a player usually wants to pick their carry unit. In a speedrun setting, the carry is a unit with the qualities that best allow them to complete the vast majority of objectives in the least amount of time. The ideal carry unit kills every enemy in one round of combat, is never at risk of death or being incapacitated, has superior mobility and suffers no terrain penalties, requires no investment to do all of the above, performs at their maximum potential in every chapter of the game, and in the specific case of this game, they should also be able to transport Roy to the throne or gate as quickly as possible because every objective in this race involves Roy seizing one of those structures. Obviously, no such ideal carry unit that fulfills all of these criteria exists in this game, but if we filter the roster to find the units that best satisfy these characteristics, we're left with four candidates, Alan, Lance, Shanna, and Milady. Unlike in other Fire Emblem games, all of these carry candidates have substantial strengths and weaknesses, which makes it hard to discern which one of them is clearly the best. Let's start with Alan and Lance. Both are Cavaliers who join in Chapter 1, quickly achieve solid offensive stats, and can support Roy and Marcus for a ton of combat bonuses. While they differ slightly in their personal stats and receive distinct support bonuses due to their affinities, Alan and Lance are practically the same unit in a draft race. They can move through maps quickly while carrying Roy on horseback and bully their way through most situations, but their inability to fly prevents them from being able to skip combat altogether, especially later in the game. In contrast, Shanna's Pegasus allows her to do just that. But this comes at the cost of having a terrible strength stat, one of the worst in the series amongst Pegasus Knights. This can be offset by support with Roy, but that also happens to be the slowest support in the game, requiring them to spend 197 turns adjacent to reach the maximum support rank. That, in combination with Shanna's poor bulk, makes it tough to get her going. While Shanna's joint time in Chapter 2 gives her easy opportunities to get the required investment, it's hard to argue that her availability is net positive as much of it is actually spent making her good enough to function in the later parts of the game. The final carry prospect is Milady, who shares with Shanna the ability to fly, but that's where the similarities end. Unlike the other carry candidates, Milady joins past the halfway point of the game in Chapter 13, forcing the player to rely solely on Marcus until then. Marcus has a reputation in this game for falling off partway through, but on normal mode, he can sustain the player for just long enough to pass a baton to Milady. Although she joins at a much higher base level than the other carries, she still needs quite a bit of investment to break the level curve and that's harder to do in Chapter 13 than it was in Chapter 2. Milady herself has very strong stats, but her lack of an easy support to boost her accuracy renders her the only carry who can have consistency issues throughout the game. So knowing all of this, which carry is a clear-cut pick for Pon Pon? It truly depends on the competitors and their degree of preparation. Playing with a Cavalier carry has a high margin of error. If you make a mistake, chances are you can still push onwards and finish the map. Conversely, playing with a Flyer carry rewards careful preparation and surgical precision. But if you don't know what you're doing, a map may become completely unbeatable. In this exhibition, we're going to assume that all the Don Don doppelgangers have done the same extensive preparation for this race, and therefore have the same information. At this skill level, Shanna emerges as the best carry by a slight margin, so she will go to Pon Pon as a first overall pick in the first round. Kong Kong 151 in position 2 is now left with the dilemma. The three remaining carries are all similar in terms of average completion time, but Milady is uniquely burdened with consistency issues. Therefore, a Cavalier pick is desirable. But there's a catch. 
The Cavalier carries are competitive only if coupled with one of the game's two prominent warp users, Saul and Nime. Without warp to assist them, the Cavalier carriage is slower than Milady by quite a large margin. So now you can see the problem. Suppose that Kankan picks Alan and the rest of round 1 plays out as such. In round 2, because the draft order is reversed, Bonbon and I get to pick a unit before Kankan does. Whoever drafted Lance is guaranteed to also get either Saul or Nime, but whoever drafted Milady has an opportunity to steal the other, leaving Kankan with no warp user. In this scenario, Kankan doesn't have much hope to win, so they are left with no other choice than to take Milady as a first round pick. It is for this reason that I believe the second position to be the weakest in this race. Bama 151 in position 3 is left with the straightforward choice between Alan and Lance, whom I had said earlier were virtually identical. Alan is overall slightly better in my opinion, as he tends to have a higher strength stat and his affinity gives extra hit through his supports, whereas Lance's affinity does not. Therefore, Bama takes Alan and I take Lance to conclude round 1 of the draft. To kick off round 2, I get a consecutive pick to pair my round 1 choice. I mentioned earlier that the Cavalier carries require co-drafting a warp user to post a competitive race time, so Bamba and I will spare no hesitation in picking Saul and Nime. Since the decision between those two units falls to me, the natural question is, which warp user will save more time? The answer is not obvious. Saul joins the team in Chapter 6 as a level 5 priest with base C rank staffs and stats suitable for a level 5 unpromoted unit. The warp staff isn't obtained until Chapter 14. In that interval time frame, Saul really provides nothing of value, and is in fact net detriment because he has to use the staff 50 times and then promote to a bishop in order to reach the A-rank staffs required to use a warp staff at all. The sum of the time spent on staff animations, level up screens, the promotion animation, and fetching the torsion barrier staffs in Chapter 7 clocks in at just shy of 8 minutes if done optimally. Conversely, Nime joins in Chapter 19 on the Ilya route or Chapter 20 on the Sakai route as level 18 druid with base A-rank staffs and a prodigious 21 magic. Nime requires no upfront investment to warp units a distance of 15 tiles away, but her late join time means that she can't speed up chapters 14 through 18 like Saul can. So after weighing these costs and benefits, which warp user is better? It turns out that Saul's ability to warp skip chapters 15 and 16 largely cancels out his 8 minute investment cost, so they end up being pretty close. Here's a rough breakdown of how much time per chapter each warp user can be expected to save. I must reiterate that this conclusion came about only after extensive testing, because even though Warp is a strong tool, it only saves time the player knows when and where to use it. Saul and Nime account for an approximately equal amount of time saved, but since Saul is able to accelerate more chapters without needing any extra assistance, he is my preferred Warp user, and I leave Nime for Bonbon. Bon. Now you might be thinking, hold up Dondon, Don. what about the other magicians in this game? Can't they also use Warp? They can, but either they're not impactful enough or they cost too much investment to be viable. Let's consider Yodel, Cecilia, Ellen, and Clarine. Yodel joins in the penultimate chapter of the race, and while he can save a little bit of time in chapters 21 and 22, he doesn't exist for the far more impactful chapter 19 and 20 Ilya warp skips, which can save about 10 minutes. Cecilia, Ellen, and Clarine all require 100 staff uses to achieve A-rank staffs. Compared to Saul's 50 staff uses, it costs 10 more minutes to grind another 50 staff uses, keeping in mind that the only way to do so is to heal someone over and over again, which in turn requires him to get hit by an enemy over and over again. And let's not even waste our breath on the E-Rank staff users, who would have to spend a whole half hour using nothing but heal just to be able to use a warp staff. By the way, although I assumed that the warp user was a Cavalier carry's ideal round 2 pick, we have to briefly consider why that assumption should be true. You can't just take my word for it. The purpose of the draft after the first round is to select characters who can help the carry pick up any additional time save. If you approach drafting from a casual player's perspective, it's tempting to pick a variety of solid units that may perform well in a typical playthrough. This is not the correct move. Training all of these units costs a lot of time, and usually they bring nothing new to the table. What's the point of having 5 units who can kill every enemy when Shanna and Marcus already kill every enemy that matters? There isn't any. The correct approach is to create a checklist of needs that each carry should expect to have based on their shortcomings. I've generated here a brief list for each team in descending order of potential time save. This will help us to understand each player's decision making in the rest of the draft. Drafting a unit ought to fulfill a need, although sometimes it may create additional lesser needs. For example, in drafting Saul and Nime, both Bonbon and I have addressed the need of a warp user. But in order for the warp user to do anything, they both need a unit specifically dedicated to fetching the warp staff in Chapter 14. And because Nime doesn't exist until Chapter 19, she also created the need for a unit to expedite Chapter 15, a map which is trivialized by a flyer or the warp staff, but is agonizingly long for a paladin to complete over land. With this perspective, let's move on to Pompon and Kankan, who have yet to make the round 2 picks. Just like how the Cavalier teams need a warp user, the Flyer teams also needed a critical piece, a thief to steal the Delphi shield from Narshan, the Chapter 16 boss. While protection from a Flyer's bow weakness is a luxury in Fire Emblem 7 and 8, in Fire Emblem 6 it is absolutely critical, 
as chapters 19 and 20 on the Ilya route featured 39 might ballistas with up to 15 range, and most maps in the Sakai route are populated with nomads wielding 15 might bows. So you might expect that the flyer teams to secure two thieves, Chad and Astolfo, to wrap up round 2. But let me now explain why this is the wrong move. Ponpon and Konkan will get to draft round 3 right after round 2, so the thieves can be picked in either round. They also need other pieces to finish their team, most notably a left hero killer in chapter 22. This hero covers a switch and must be pressed before Roy can fight the final boss. It's really far out of the way, so having dedicated units to complete that task can save a bit of time. The candidates for the left hero killer are Percival or a combination of a warp user plus any of a handful of other characters. Because Saul and Nime have both been picked, and Shanna's team also wants a left hero killer, then the next four picks between Pompon and Konkan should be Chad, Estolfo, Percival, and Yodo in some order. For the purposes of this race, Chad and Estolfo's differences are not meaningful, so they are interchangeable. If you look at what else Milady's team needs, she does not really want to pick a unit that creates even more needs to cover. Yodel doesn't have much value if he doesn't have a target to warp who can defeat the left hero 1v1, nor if there's no one to get the warp staff in the first place. That is why Konkan's best round 2 pick is Percival, leaving Yodel to be scooped up by Ponpon. The flyer carries will then use a round 3 picks to secure their thieves. Although the thieves are of little value to the cavalier teams, passing up a thief pick at this point in the draft is risky for a flyer team. By the time the draft returns to them in round 4, there may only be Cass, or worse, no thieves left to draft. Picking Cass is not a terrible prospect because she only costs a couple of minutes to recruit, provided that the player knows the optimal route to recruit her. But drafting no thief at all may cause the race to be completely lost. Better to be safe than sorry. With that done, the cavalier carries to continue to gather pieces to patch up their team's needs in rounds 3 and 4. Although individual picks are less impactful at this stage in the draft, the decisions are no less interesting because three of the four players are vying for units who perform the same roles. Let's break down each team's remaining needs and which units can address them. We've already made a cursory mention of the Chapter 22 Left Hero Killers and the Chapter 14 Warp Finders. Of the remaining Hero Killers, Igren and Cecilia are the best because they have no recruitment cost, with Igren having a slight edge in terms of combat. Ray is a Hero Killer who can also dig up the Warp Staff, but he has a minor recruitment cost and incurs a promotion animation to be used in this way. Hugh forces an unskippable recruitment dialogue on top of costing gold to recruit, and it's faster just to kill him, but if you really need a hero killer, he can fit the bill. The warp finders are all the remaining unpromoted infantry magicians. Ellen is the best option because she has no recruitment cost, while Lou and Ray have a minor recruitment cost, probably under 30 seconds. Lena appears to be a good choice on the basis of a free recruitment, but she actually doesn't have the durability to survive the one enemy encounter that she has to face on the way to the warp staff. That said, you can still use Lena if you have no other option. You just have to pair her with Sophia and sacrifice one of them while the other picks up the warp staff. All of these characters are suited for this role because they can traverse the chapter 14 desert unimpeded to find the warp staff in the southeast corner of the map using the desert item trick. Nime's team has an additional need for a unit who can speed up the completion of chapter 15. The terrain in chapter 15 forces grounded units to navigate a long spiral path in order to reach the gate, which is otherwise easily accessed with a flyer or a warp user. Of all the remaining units, there are four who can meaningfully shorten this map. Thea, Gonzalez, Geese, and Garrett. Thea is a Pegasus Knight who joins in Larum's version of Chapter 11 and has a most time-saving potential by flying over the mountains to drop Roy and a Paladin. However, Thea also has the costliest recruitment sequence in the game, which is both complex and subject to RNG, and that recruitment alone can offset any benefit she will provide in this chapter. The remaining helpers for Chapter 15 are the Berserkers, who can traverse peak tiles and cross a narrow mountainous section below the gate, bypassing the northern half of the map. Of the three candidates, Gonzalez is the least viable because he is logistically difficult to recruit with the Bare Bones team. On the other hand, Geese joins in the same map as Gonzalez in Larum's route, but he can promote right away, and his starting position on the map as an NPC unit requires the player to lose only a small amount of time. Lastly, Garrett is a pre-promoted enemy unit in Chapter 15 who must first be recruited by Lilina, but his behavior renders that simple, though subject to a little bit of RNG. Pompon ought to draft a Berserker at some point, but the matter of when is an interesting question. Let's shift our focus now to Milady's team, which has a couple of unique needs. Their most pressing need is that of a mounted unit to help transport Roy in some of the earlier chapters while Marcus is busy fighting. None of the other teams have this need, because they can use their carry to fight while Marcus transports Roy, or vice versa. The viable units for this role are the members of the Chapter 7 Ilya Cavalry Squad, Zealot, Noah, and Trek. Zealot is the best option because he has superior stats and movement, but Noah and Trek are both perfectly suitable for the role if Zealot is stolen by another player. The Milady team's other need is a bit more unusual. They would like to have a unit who can rescue Noah in Chapter 7 to stop him from running around and wasting time as an NPC unit. There are six characters at that point who can do this. Clarine, Deke, Wade, Lot, Bors, and Sue. 
This role has high redundancy, and the units are largely useless outside of baiting status, so Kankan can safely wait until a later round in the draft to pick one of them. Before I proceed with the rest of the draft, I want to discuss Denial Picking. A Denial Pick is a choice that primarily hurts another player's team instead of helping one's own. In general, it is not a great idea to pick units won't offer any significant benefit to one's own team unless a player believes that no more value remains in the draft. A Denial Pick hurts yourself and one other player, but generally not anyone else. For example, suppose a Bobon chooses a Gren in round 3. I could take Geese and Garrett in rounds 3 and 4, which would force Bombon to do Chapter 15 the longest way possible or figure out a way to recruit Gonzalez. But since I don't get to pick another character until the end of round 5, there's a good chance that I won't get a Hero Killer or a Warp Finder. The remaining two players are content with this outcome because they were not affected by my decision. So now that we understand why it's better to draft in a player's self-interest, let's see what that might look like. Bombon takes Ray in round 3, which checks out the roles of Left Hero Killer and Warp Finder. Even though Ray isn't optimal for either task, the fact that he can do both means that Bombon only has to pick a Berserker in round 4 in order to complete their team. I summarily take Agren in round 3 and Ellen in round 4 to address all of my needs. I could try to deny a unit from someone else instead of picking Ellen, but I can't safely take both Berserkers or threaten all three of the Ilian cavalry without putting my draft at risk. Bombon then happily drafts Garrett as expected. Kankan's next decision in the fourth round comes as a surprise. They decide to pick Thea. Didn't I say earlier that Thea was too costly to even consider recruiting? And why would Kankan want Thea when they already have Milady, who is better in every way? The answer is that there's a quirk in the rules that gives Thea value. You see, there's a clause in the rule set that allows a player to deploy undrafted units if they can recruit one of that player's drafted units in a given chapter. Without this clause, it would be impossible to recruit certain units without taking a penalty. Drafting Thea allows Kankan to deploy Shanna in Chapter 11 of Larum's route, but they are not obligated to recruit Thea. Instead, Shanna may perform a different legal move, which is to visit a village for a dragon shield. To my knowledge, this is the only way to obtain this item that costs very little time, and Milady especially values it because it shores up some of her consistency problems. In making this pick, Kankan risks being denied Zealot, but even so, they are guaranteed to get one of the Ilian Cavaliers in Round 5, which is no big deal. But had Kankan chosen Zealot instead in round 4, Pompon could have taken Thea to deny that dragon shield from Milady's team. As there is not much point now in trying to deny the Ilian cavalry, Pompon picks Cecilia in round 4 and Lu in round 5 to close out their team. Kankan summarily takes Zealot in round 5 to do the same. After this point in the draft, none of the remaining units provide any value beyond being a warm body to sponge enemy status. One reason why Fire Emblem 6 is such a difficult draft race is a prevalence of enemy status staff users who have huge range and high accuracy. Because a player is limited in which units they can deploy, and isn't guaranteed to have a unit who can use a restore staff, status staffs are run killers for those who race unprepared. Fortunately, if you understand how to manipulate the enemy AI, all scenarios involving enemy status staffs are trivial with some creative strategizing. To do so, a team has to draft several flunkies, a term coined by raisins to denote units whose sole value is their existence rather than any of their personal traits. For a flunky, the two critical characteristics are that they exist for whatever task is demanded of them, and that they cost nothing to add to the team. Every so often, there may be a trait that gives some flunkies a minor edge over the crowd, but when all is said and done, they're pretty much equivalent. Fortunately, Fire Emblem 6 has a lot of flunkies. We'll assign them arbitrarily, keeping in mind that Milady's team still needs a specific flunky who can rescue Noah in Chapter 7. I decided to stop the draft after round 8, because the remaining undrafted units either provide no additional value or are not worth the player's time to recruit. So that concludes the draft phase of this Fire Emblem The Binding Blade normal mode draft phase exhibition. In a follow-up video, my three doppelgangers and I will put these teams to the test. Who do you think is the best chance to win? And do you disagree with any of our choices here? Leave your thoughts in the comments below, and while you're at it, feel free to drop a like or a sub. This has been Don 51 and see you all next time.